You ready for a reboot? Welcome to the Sheila Mack Show, reality at its finest. History reminds us those hit hardest often become the change makers. This year, we've all hit crazy economic, social, and emotional rock bottoms. We all get knocked down. Something hits globally, locally, personally. It affects our health, finances, our relationships. We have to recreate a business or career. Each show, Sheila and her special guest will be sharing their reboot stories, guiding you with real solutions to upgrade and up-level emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, and financially. Here on NBC's KCAA Radio, if you're ready to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and bra straps, enjoy a listen. Here's Sheila. Welcome to the Sheila Mack Show, reality at its finest. Here we have real people sharing real stories and actionable steps to help you reinvent, rebuild, and reboot your business and personal life on your terms. I'm your host, Sheila Mack, and today we have special guest, Larry Camp. Larry is uh, somebody who has read Nobody Knows. Uh, they they just want to think like they do. You know why he believes that... Um, he has some great, compelling, and inspirational stories to share with us. Now, um, some of the things that he can offer is he definitely has a no BS approach to life, knowing that everyone is going to experience good times, bad times, and a whole lot of in-between. That's for sure, Larry. Um, Larry got his degree in sports broadcasting and worked for a time at an NBC station. He also spent 22 years in the corporate world, retiring from Shell Oil. These years in the corporate world enabled him to travel the country and talk about this life. So um, welcome to the show, Larry. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. All right. And this show is based on my new best-selling book, Bootstraps and Bra Straps, the formula to go from rock bottom back into action in any situation. And we have had some situations since the pandemic hit for sure. So I'd like to start off by asking if you have a time in your business or personal life where you experienced a difficult situation and how you got back on track. Well, yeah. And I think I've, I've had, like people, a lot of difficult situations. Um, part of mine, I guess, that might make mine a little bit more unique is that I was born into a very high demand religion that controlled almost every aspect of my life. And without getting into a lot, a lot of detail, I got married at a very early age because that's what we were encouraged to do. Uh, we were not allowed to have any kind of sex or anything outside of marriage. So, you know, you meet somebody and I knew a girl for six, seven years. We got married and uh, we were told that if we followed the leaders council and that is to you know be all the rules get married in their temple and so forth we would be blessed and after 18 months she's like uh, i don't want to be married anymore wow. and uh so that was just devastating to me because i i believe that there was like one person for every person and uh when i realized that wasn't the case i had to kind of you know reevaluate uh, what my beliefs were and, and everything else but that was just one i've, I've had a, a number of things Yes, yes, that's something that that happens, and many times our, we raise our children in one religion, and they go off and do another. And it's kind of one of those things that happens where sometimes a religion is just not a good fit, um, but it's something that sticks in our head. So we have those beliefs of, oh my gosh, you know, she left, and this is against what I've been taught is supposed to happen. What's this about? And so that's that's a whole identity crisis that we get in life. And I think we have many of those as we go on. Um, so that's that's really important um, to, to, I don't know, to be able to go through at a young age. You were really young <laughs> still. Well, yeah, I think, the, I think the majority of people are, are the religion that their parents were. I mean, you know, you're born if your parents, and my parents were Mormons. So, I mean, being born in Provo, Utah, while they were going to BYU, what are the odds I'm not going to be Mormon, right? So, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. But at some point, like you mentioned, everybody kind of has to make a decision for themselves. Am I going to continue with this? I'm going to go a different route. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a crossroads of many of us that grew up in religion, you know, come to at some point. Yes, yes. And then I, I don't know, for myself, I, I too had 
I had many different families growing up um, and, and 10 to 13 homeless and all these different things. And I was raised Catholic, but then I went to all these other homes and, uh, you know, through, through my life uh, at one point, I, I think 13 and a half, I did foster care until 15 and then went out on my own. So it's it very interesting because I got to live with different people that had completely different religions and see what that was about. And it was it was it was like a field trip to get to learn all these you know I had to go to the temple or the the church or the whatever it was and and depending on the week it was and then I got to see how the, the religion was and how the people lived based on that or through it and I I don't know it it gave me a little bit of an idea that you know we're all these beautiful incredible people no matter what the religion is but the religion was something that held people together at the same time. Uh, when when you mm -hmm. lose somebody, when you go through a tough time, to have some kind of a, a spiritual something um, does help these these practices that we have in our lives, um, traditions, cultural traditions, faith traditions, whatever they are. There's something that uh, gives us peace when we don't have any peace. So, right, and I and I think if you grow up in a in a religion that tells you that they're the only true one, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you find out, whoops, maybe that's not the case. Right. That then you end up then you end up writing a book like this right here mm. that says nobody knows. They just want you to think they do. Yeah. And the reason I wrote that is because I came to the realization that if I meet somebody and they start to tell me about their religious views or this or that, or or whatever, it could be that they believe there's aliens walking amongst us or whatever, I'll just simply say, I believe you believe. Yes. And, uh, yes. and I'm with that, you know, as long as, hey, as long as they're not hurting other people or impacting people in a negative way, you can believe whatever you want. I don't have any problem with that. But I, I consider myself now a humanist as, as, you know, before I would have considered myself, you know, a Mormon or whatever. So, I mean, now I just try to, like you said, treat people kindly, you know, help people that are, uh, less fortunate and you know if i think we all do that and you know we, we all get along a lot better not get too caught up in our own personal beliefs that we've got to try to ram down other people's throats so mm, so true so true and i you know i have many people that i know that have left one religion and are looking and seeking something <laughs> and they've gone to every single study and course about every single one. And it's like, they're trying to replace one uh, book of rules for the other book of rules. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's, and it's interesting because they were raised with this book of rules. So they had to get away from it, but they had to quickly find something to replace it. And, and that to me is like, okay, but it's all about, but what if, you know, so it, it is, it's a personal choice and it's a beautiful thing to have that freedom um, that's something that we are blessed with in, in this country, definitely. And um, no matter what, uh, and the, the, the chance to be able to study and understand other cultures and religions is something that connects us to people. So uh, yeah. I- And said, Sheila, you, you mentioned, uh -huh. I was gonna say, you mentioned that you lived with a lot of different people when you were growing up and that you got, um, you know, you were made aware of different religions, different cultures and things. and that right there in itself is an education because if you never are able to get outside of this bubble that maybe you are living under mm -hmm. um then that's all you believe that's all you know you don't realize there's anything more in the world but i was fortunate that my parents ended up moving to different parts of the country you know job related of course but i mean that meant that we were now with different groups and seeing different ideas many times I mean, we lived in San Diego. There was only four Mormons in my whole school, and one of them was my sister. So, I mean, you know, you you need to get along with other people. And I think that's the thing is that when you're not living in a community where everybody thinks and looks and views the world the same as you, then you get educated. And that's, that's what is really good. And I think that the more we can educate ourselves on whatever it is. I mean, you know, I'm not a big person who likes to talk politics or really at this point in my life, but, but I do believe that being educated and understanding, you know, what's going on is a good thing. Yes. And, you know, to be able to understand the people, um, to understand all of humanity is to understand the cultures, the religions, the beliefs, and, and where people are coming from, because then you can meet them where they're at. 
and okay, that's what that's about. Uh, there's a lot of unwritten rules that may not even come up that you would know coming from your background, your parents, um, the, the, the Mormon religion or whatever religion, it could be X. And, and those unwritten rules come to the table in a business meeting in their own right. way. And if you're not aware of what those kind of things are, it's, it's like you're missing a big part of the conversation or getting into a relationship to have these conversations before getting into a committed relationship because dating is great. But then if you have to like live together and, and, you know, maybe have children together, whatever, build a life together. These conversations are so many unwritten rules that show up. Yeah. And, yeah. and you have to, <laughs> yeah. And you have to be able to change and, and adapt. And I, I came up, you know, when I entered broadcasting in 19, 83 it was very rare to have females doing the news or um it was they were just kind of entering into the into, into that business really um more behind the scenes and things like that so 1983 you know our our newscaster was male the weatherman was male i was doing sports now this was a small station in farmington new mexico so but i think it's it's also gave you a glimpse to what was going on even in the larger cities at that time now when you turn news like just this morning, it was all female. There wasn't one male on the on the broadcast, and it just shows you that you know some people like to, oh I like the old days. No, you know what I, I I like the where we are now is in terms of you know women being treated more equally, being a, be able to. I mean they're still not equal, right? We know that there's still a pay difference between men and women, you know, so, but we're making great strides, and that's what I'm saying. So some people just kind of like to remember the glory days or what they believe were the glory days, whereas. I actually embrace, you know, the changes going on in the world. And I think that sometimes you mentioned when we started this podcast at the very beginning, you know, what is something that's happened to you that kind of you had to kind of adapt or move on from or, uh, you know, another thing that happened three years ago was our 31 year old son, Dusty, had a ruptured iliac artery and died in an hour. Mm. I was at a softball tournament in Las Vegas. My wife was in Hawaii because our daughter had just given birth to our first grandchild and and he was in Phoenix, Arizona. So that event changed our lives and because back to the religion, when we were active Mormons, we had it all figured out. We had a plan. We knew that when you died, you were, where you were going, what was going to happen. But we had left Mormonism a couple of years prior to that. So now what? Where did he go? Where is he? You know, so we had to be, be OK with the fact that we don't know. I mean, we hope to see him again, but yeah, and, and you know, a, a loss of a child or even a spouse or whatever, it really changes your outlook on uh, on life and maybe what's important and you can not, you know, sweat the small stuff. Yeah, so that is something that I, you know, I, I have a similar story um, back in December 2019 um, I lost my youngest son and he was 22 also. So it's this, you know, and he went to sleep. He had a heart condition, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, and he just didn't wake up. He had a lot of caffeine that day, nothing else really out of the ordinary, but um, this happens and it uh, was really a difficult journey for the whole family. I had adult children moved home before the pan. Now this is right before the pandemic hit. So for us, uh, we, we, we attend a, um, like a non-denominational, like agape center. That's like everybody. And so we, we had a beautiful right. service and we found a, a beautiful place, um, a resting place for him that, that, regarding religions we picked out we felt very guided my daughter and i went looking and we felt so guided to this place because it was up on a hill you see the hollywood sign in the distance and all the the birds and nature and and everything and there's there's a christian a catholic and there's a, a buddhist monk um, and and they they chant every day and i was like oh he likes music there there's music playing and there's all these different religions represented all the at this it's a huge um 
cemetery. And so they're all there. And I thought whoever visits, wherever they're from, if they have a faith tradition, it's probably here <laughs> or represented definitely. And so they're somewhere, it's really for them. And for whoever visits, whoever has a connection, he was, uh, you know, almost engaged. He was dating this girl for like four years that they were so in love, whatever. And so there's this whole group and a very large family, um, you know, six kids in my my family. I adopted three. And so um, that's that's what we chose. And it just gave me peace knowing that there's somewhere for everyone if they need it. And and so it was really for them. And that I, I brought to me, my personal thought was, okay, I feel a presence and I feel something and every now and then. And there's a whole grieving that happens for parents that society, I think they give you seven days or six days off work for yeah. grieving. I mean, that's like, you can't even feel in six days. You can bear, I mean, no. <laughs> about you, but for me, it, it was not, it was more right. than six days, that's for sure. And so think about that. That's something. And it's a process that takes a while. Holidays are still hard. For my children, too, the ones that were the best friends, the closest to him, especially because I had a big age gap. The, the ones that were, you know, they were best friends and siblings. Wow. You know, these holidays and times we still talk. And there was a permission that we had that we have permission to cry, to scream, to yell, to do whatever we need to do. Wake me up at three in the morning if you need to talk. And that's how we got through it. And it was OK. And I, I think that society, there's that whole thing, laugh and the whole world laughs with you cry and you cry alone. And it's the truth right. that people don't know how to respond. What do you say? What do you, they don't know how, how do you feel? How, how can they even help? And, or maybe if we don't talk about it, it'll just go away and we don't have to feel your sadness. I'm not sure. You know, first, you know, I'm sorry for your loss. It's, it's, a, it's a club that nobody wants to be a member of. That's for sure. Exactly. And, uh, and there is no rules when it comes to grieving. I mean, you're right. The, the world, I mean, rightfully so. They, they move on with their lives and things. And then us that have experienced this loss, we'll never get over it. It's, we think about these children every day. And, and, you know, on the one month anniversary of my son's passing, um, I went and got a tattoo on my wrist. I don't know if you can see it or not, but whoop, yeah. it, says, yeah. it says dusty there. But uh, I got that and I put it so that the word is facing out. His name is facing out. So if I reach my hand out to somebody, they can see that. And so mm -hmm. people will say, oh, you got, got a tattoo. What is that? And, and then I get to talk about my son. Yeah. So that's the whole reason for doing it. Is it I believe that is, um, as long as we mention this name of our child, mm -hmm. then that child is still relevant and that child is still part of our lives. And, and so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And just you talking about your son and me talking about my son today, we're remembering them. And, and I think that's important. Yes. And I yesterday, I actually had um, two different people had lost their children, an adult and a baby. And they called me because I shared my story and, and we talked. And um, so this is something that the communication is open and they know it's a safe place to talk about. And then they wouldn't call some other people. And maybe we don't even talk that much, but we had a parent to parent talk. And then it was like, okay, now these are the things we're gonna do. you know. And, and that whole book that I wrote, my second chapter is on grief, feel your feelings. And it goes through, if I had a best friend that just lost a, a child or a loved one, um, any loved one, it's kind of that point where you're in a fog, you're in a you're in a state of shock, and you need somebody. Sometimes you'd love to have somebody say, "Okay, let's get through these steps that we, you know, what do you want? What's your choices on these steps to walk you through until you're back to being able to walk yourself and be able to go on a little bit." And it, it's going to take a long time. So, did you write that chapter after you uh, no. lost your son before? No. I wrote it before and okay. uh, 
Yep. So it was definitely a gift to myself and yeah. something that definitely all my kids actually read the book before. And then we re they reread that chapter during that time and it really yeah. helped. So, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I actually did a reissue of my book because my book came out just, I mean, six months or maybe a year before my son passed. And what I did was because these are print on demand books, it's pretty simple. I can go and write another chapter and just insert it into the book. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. um, and it was therapeutic for me to, to write a chapter about losing a child and about talking about my son and about what happened. And, and so, yeah, I, I actually just, so my books come and say, hey, I thought your book came out before it does. yet <laughs> I added the chapter. So, mm. but yeah, so again, and we all, we all handle it differently, but uh, you don't get through this life without some stumbles and some issues and some, some things you have to overcome and everybody does. And, and my podcast is just, it's called Nobody Knows Your Story and people just come on and they tell their story and they're very interesting. And sometimes people say, oh, I don't have an interesting life. I didn't, I haven't done it. Then you sit down and talk with it for 45 minutes. And it's like, you, you've had an interesting life and an impactful life. And yeah, yeah so yes. it's fun. Yes, that's great. Now I'd love to hear a little bit more about what's in some of the other chapters in your book. If you could give some examples. <laughs> well, we've been talking a little bit about it. The, because my book is somewhat of a memoir, I actually start off and talk about my story growing up Mormon. I, I actually mentioned briefly um, how we found out about, you know, that, that for us, it wasn't a good fit anymore. And it was actually from our daughter um, who was attending BYU of all places. She came home at Christmas break and she says, hey, what, what have you guys heard about the church essays? And we're like, she goes, yeah, the church came out with these essays where they kind of are they're different from everything I was taught growing up. And so we'd never heard of them. We read them. And um, so after at that point, then we did some further investigating. And for us, you know, we just couldn't align ourselves anymore with with that religion. Now, so I talk about that in the book a little bit, but not much, because I try to be respectful also of my family and my wife, Judy's family, because they're all still members of that faith for the most part. There's a couple that have left. Most of them are still in. So we're very respectful. And, you know, we have we don't haven't had it. We haven't lost anybody. You know how some religions, you know, they ban you or banish you if you leave or something. Nah, we haven't experienced any of that, okay. but you know, so, so my book really just, um, as I've gone through my life and of course, a lot of it was in the corporate world where I ended up, uh, working for shell oil. I ran all the Jiffy Lube stores, if you are familiar with those and I had the West coast. So I was traveling all the time, mm. but it gave me the opportunity to meet a lot of people and to learn some skills that, that really, yes, they're great in the business world, but they also work with your friends and with your family and everything too. Um, and then I talk about things like being the organizer, because I don't know about you, but when I was a little boy, I wanted to play baseball after school or something. And I'd say to my friends, Hey, we should do this. Yeah, yeah, we should do it. And that'd be the end of it. So finally I decided, okay, why don't we do this? Let's meet here at three 30. And in all my life, I've been this organizer. So I would put together softball teams and go out of state and play tournaments and this and that. People are very willing to participate as long as you mm -hmm. do the organizing. And uh, so we, we talk about that. And I think that what these are is my book is really just a series of chapters dealing with, yeah, my thoughts, my take on life, but also I think things that are very similar for all of us. And these are character traits, things that we all have and some choose to maybe, um, emphasize some of them more than others. You know, you're, you know, I'm sure you're an organizer in your own way. I'm, I'm sure many people are, but, uh, but yeah, so we talk about, I just talk about some of those types of things. And when I get together and I speak in front of groups, what I usually talk about, uh, depending on who the group is, um, I'll just talk about how we navigate this world and this life and do so in a way that we can say at the end of the day, Hey, I, I had a good day. This was a good day. I was able to do this. I was able to do that. I would help somebody. But my employees, if you went up to them at any time when I was working in that corporate world and said, what's Larry's motto? They'd say, fun is good. Mm. Because that, was, that was my motto. I had a big banner made and I'd put it up at our meetings and it's fun is good. And so we would talk about how do we create fun at a time when there's stress 
and maybe turnover at the store and we don't have enough people to get the cars in and out. But how can we create a fun environment when that is going on? Yeah. Hey, there's times where it's difficult, no, no doubt. But I mean, at the end of the day, if we can look back and say, well, that was tough, but we got through it and, you know, a little fun. Then, you know, that's kind of what it's all about, too. So, you know, I, we just can't escape the, the, the drama and the trauma that's going to happen to us at times in our life. And so I've mm -hmm. just always been a glass is half full guy. And I just try to, you know, carry that out, out you know, and with the people I'm with. I used to tell my children, I'm sure you did too, Sheila, that, you know, you, you have choices when it comes to who you want to spend your time with. Why not spend your time with people who are going to build you up and make you a better person rather than tear you down and, you mm -hmm. know, make you have depressive thought, whatever. So, yeah, I just, I just think that, you know, I just try to see the positive in the world. I know there's a lot of negative if you watch the news every day, you know, yes. and my advice to people is don't watch the news every day, yes. you know, check in once in a while, but you don't have to watch it three times a day, you know, like some of my family. <laughs> oh yes. We could be very concerned right now if we watch the news <laughs> too much because it's crazy times <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Now, these yeah. are some times I'll tell you. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's something that I remember during the pandemic, uh, with my adult kids home, I never really had a lot of TV going on in my life because I worked and I traveled the world for seven years. I did all these great things and had fun. I actually brought the youngest two with me when I was traveling and then did a lot of um, training with Tony Robbins and had a blast. And, and we learned from everywhere and went everywhere on the planet practically. Uh, so I'm home and they're turning on the news when this all started and nobody knows. And, you know, <laughs> I'm like, freaking out about this because of the news and I finally said please can we just have like time for the news and time not for the news where we can listen to happy music and just dance around or just I just can't take it anymore and it actually helped them as much as it yeah. helped it really was a lot for me <laughs> and so it's it's nice to be aware and obviously you need to know what's going on especially nowadays because it could affect your work or your, you know, what's going on in your city or state. But then there's what's going on in your home and how can that, and your right. community and how can you connect to people and, and have that fun. So yeah. that's so important. And that fun thing, I think that's something I also brought into my life uh, throughout the years that made all the difference. I, I remember being a very young girl, I had gift stores starting at 23 going forward, big 5,000 square foot stores. And, and I would have fun. I would have like, um, I would go to, this is California. So I would go to third street, Santa, uh, Santa Monica, third street promenade. And I would find the musicians on the street. And I would say, would you like to perform in front of a big group? And they would drive over to my, my first store and they would drive over and perform on the weekends. I was the only store open. And all the restaurants are open. All the other stores go away. I'm making three times profit. And I'm I'm younger than anybody there that owns the store. <laughs> and I'm just having fun. Everybody mm -hmm. eats their food and they hear the music. They come over. I give them free tea and I sell the tea too. And they buy all kinds of things. And we're dancing around because this was my fun. This was I had to bring yeah. fun to work and, because that was my business. I had to run it. And so I always had fun. And then later I got hired to work in politics and they said, what's your political beliefs? And I said, well, free spirit. I, I didn't have a <laughs> political party, but I was hired right. because I could work with people in groups and lead. And it was okay, get out the vote for this and that. And it was a lot of nonpartisan things, raising all these kids that I worked on. And so, um, you know, education for all, all these things. And so it was that, and it was because it was fun, people showed up. And when the, the boring, maybe they knew a lot more. They did. I know they knew way more about politics than I did, but they didn't know about people and fun. And so they, it was boring and they'd leave. <laughs> so then please, Sheila, come back and help with this, organize this, we'll pay you. And that's how that kind of showed up. And so fun, it, it think about it for kids, Right now, they're stuck home. Maybe they're the homeschooling, depending on your state where you live, it's the rules are crazy or they're sent home every few weeks because of a outbreak or I don't know what. But uh, <laughs> so then they're home and they're bored 
so you got to make it a little more fun. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, do your homework and, you know, it's not school. That's yeah, and I mentioned to you that, you know, my, my involvement with Hawaii, and there's still a condo that I take care of over on the island of Maui in Kihei. And so last, last year, pandemic, I mean, we were pretty booked for the whole year. All of a sudden, people would be like, hey, we need to cancel. Sorry, we, we got to cancel. And mm -hmm. so we were like refunding, refunding, refunding for like a solid year, almost from like March of 2020, I guess it was, all the way through the end of the year. And I don't think we had people starting to kind of trickle back until like maybe January or February of this year. And you know, even now, and we went over for a few weeks, um, we moved from uh, Maui back here to the mainland a few year, years ago. But like I say, I still take care of that condo and I'm very involved and we still go quite a bit. And so we, when we were there, I still noticed the same things that I like, the, you know, the, the spirit of aloha that I feel from the people that live there, the, of course, the wet the ocean we're big into the ocean where you know we uh all those things were still there so if you didn't know there was a pandemic or something going on you you, you just think everything was normal mm. but it, it wasn't you know so and that's kind of the world we're living in right now I, people for the most part are kind of like ready to move on and gosh we were down for a year and a half let's get on with life but yet you have to still kind of be careful and you you know, if you're flying somewhere, you, you know, probably have to wear a mask and you have to do these things. And if you're going to Hawaii, you have to show proof of vaccination. And when we went, we had to do a 72 hour in advance negative test as well, which was a little stressful. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, yeah, I'm not sure if those things will go away, that we may always have something. Or I say always, but maybe for the next few years, we have something that um, I don't know, you know, because we've talked about the news, right? I don't watch it every day, but if I, if I skip three days and watch it, I really haven't missed anything because they're talking about the same things they talked about three days earlier. Yeah. And, right. uh, you know, so, so a lot of times it takes a while before they actually know what they're talking about. They might say, hey, booster shots might be coming, well, mm -hmm. you know, wait a week. And they say booster shots might still be coming. Right. And then eventually, oh, they're here. So it's like, I, I just kind of don't worry about it too much until it's something to, to worry about but mm. you just have to navigate it you have to get through it and you know for me Hawaii has always been kind of one of those spots you know that that has brought me peace okay. and, and and it's been something that's been a part of my life since I was a teenager so I've just yeah. always enjoyed it. nice yes that's something Hawaii is one of our one of the places that some of my kids want to go back to we used to go once or twice a year to Hawaii and now with all the restrictions we're like not everybody wants to go um, but <laughs> but we have yeah. friends who visited us from Hawaii they were actually some of the first people that flew over and visited us uh, because they they were like well we did all these things and we just travel and we could not travel so it wasn't a problem for them uh, but there's there's a magic and an energy there and that those islands definitely that it's a little different and it is a little spiritual, at least for me when I go, Oh my gosh, I could just feel things and hear things that, that um, I don't know. It's, it's pretty cool. Now I've, I've gone to just, I guess the main, main Island. And then um, what was the island that we went to Kauai. Um, oh, it was a very quiet and laid back and very, not very many people. If that was the, then you went to Kauai. <laughs> yeah, that, then we went to Kauai. Well, but we went to like um, a Tony Robbins relationship event there. A few okay. Times. And so that was um, different <laughs> to say the right. least. And, and so we had a blast. And, and so that was something. And there, there's an energy, I guess in each Island, it might even feel different. The energy. It does to me. Yeah, yeah, it does to me for sure. I mean, I went to school on Oahu, you know, Wahoo's Honolulu, which is a big city. So I would never go there because I just felt like I was in Los Angeles or something. Yeah. But you know, if you stay over on the North shore of Oahu, it's pretty nice. My daughter lived there for six years because her husband's in the Coast Guard and they were stationed there. And um, so we, we'd stay over there and we felt at home. It was great. And that's how Maui feels to us because Maui is geographically a little bit larger than Oahu, but has about one eighth the population. So yeah. we just never felt like, you know, we were, you know, there's no traffic. There's not even a freeway on out. I mean, <laughs> it's very right. different. Yes. So that's, that is, and I mean, I have traveled to so many beautiful islands, Fiji, obviously to, mm -hmm. to island um, retreat vacation place there quite a few times. And, 
that's there's something it's like the world just shifts and it's quiet and it's peaceful and sometimes we need that so. We do. Yeah. And I, I, I encourage people whether, because I run into people that go, yeah, Hawaii was okay, but yeah, it didn't do much for me. I'm like, fine. It's okay. I mean, you certainly don't want everybody wanting to go to Hawaii. Uh, right. So that's fine. But whatever it is, if you have a place, we live here. If, if I took my camera and showed it out, out my window over here, we have a huge red mountain that we live right behind here, or in front of, I guess. And so around here in Southern Utah, where I am right now, we, we're less than an hour from Zion National Park. We have all these beautiful red mountains. And some people feel exactly about these red mountains the same way I do about Hawaii. And they mm -hmm. just feel it's a magical place. They feel that there's a, a spiritual um, feeling that they have when they're walking on these mountains or on these trails and things. And so I get it. I get it. I totally do. So Yes. Yeah. People, it affects people differently. And whatever that is in your life that gives you that special feeling, then, you know, you need to do more of it. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And, you know, that was that was something for me. I was guided to move my main home to a beautiful lake um, community that is kind of away. We're in the city and we have everything, but we have a lake and and it's a different feel. And I said, I want my my life like every day to be on vacation. And this was yeah. before the pandemic and like, but not too, too far ahead. So it was right before I lost my son, actually, I did the move and then the kids moved over with me, most of them. Um, so, so that was, I, I ended up buying a big house and people were like, why are you going to buy a big house? And I said, well, it was the same price as the little houses. And I used to do real estate years ago. So I kind of know it's better to get more square footage when you've got to go sell in the future. <laughs> So, mm -hmm. and, I said, and then everybody will visit. Well, they did. They they visited all right. <laughs> now they live here, so it it does work out. And uh, it's something. Design your environment. It doesn't matter where you're placed. I think it's the you know make your home, whatever your office. That environment really makes a difference. People walk into my home and they're like, oh, I want to stay. I feel welcome. I want to relax. I can talk. It's a whole different feel. And it's not perfect. It's by far not perfect. But but it's comfortable and it's safe. And that's that's what I wanted with my home. And and so and there's the outdoors and all these beautiful things that you go to the lake and take a boat ride. Everybody comes over, takes a boat ride with us, whatever. So that's, that's what I wanted to design and live. And we have a choice, even when I lived in places that were not perfect, that was something that I created. So, you know, I wrote this book. I started with, I bought this beautiful home after traveling seven years and after I did my travels, I was like, okay, I'm done. I need like to have a home again. <laughs> and because I rented homes out full time and just travel full time. Literally, I saw everything on the bucket list. So I bought a home in Ventura, California. Day that I finished designing it and making it that beautiful, peaceful place was, was the night. I'm driving home from a long day at work. I, was, I just want to go home and rest. And we had the Ventura fire and I lost everything. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow, I have to put this. I mean, like the other car, everything was gone. Cat was gone, which was probably the hardest. And so I had to go stay at one of my, I had a prefab mobile home that I rented out to Airbnb, like vacation rental. It was three units and a little shed in the back. And I stayed in the shed, the 400 square foot shed. And everybody wanted to stay because they lost their home too. And this was a beautiful, it was the most interesting thing because it was a five-star vacation. People had their honeymoon in my vacation mobile home. <laughs> the canyon. And it's like, what? What are you talking about? It's like the, the energy that was created and the way it was designed and it had this yoga deck and the view and it was beautiful and peaceful and, and, People went there to get away from it all. I paid pennies yeah. for the, you know. So it's it's not about. It could be a. It was a very humble place, and you know I used some principles and got sent somewhere else and ended up in Beverly Hills and had a beautiful home there that is now rented out and I'm at the lake. But but that was that showed me that it doesn't matter 
how humble. I mean, I think I paid 35,000 for that little mobile home. And it was it was making me an income of six to eight thousand a month. <laughs> and it and it wow. and people were safe there. And and when the fires hit, they had a home. And that's yeah. and it was like and it cost very little. And so that was it was all about the feeling. Yeah, and that's a nice area. My my cousins grew up in Oxnard and I spent a lot of time there as a, in my younger days. But uh, you know, you were talking about losing that home. Mm -hmm. And we talked about grief earlier. Yeah. You know, it's very easy to associate grief with the loss of a loved one. But, you know, when you lose your religion or you lose a home um, in a fire like that, uh, that's, that's a, that brings on some grief also. And that can take some time to get over. And, you know, you look at all these fires that are going on in, in the West right now, particularly California. A lot of people have lost their homes. I used to have a store when I told you I, I ran all the Jiffy Lubes on the West Coast. I had one in Paradise, California. Yep. And when they had that fire, the campfire, I think it was two years ago, mm. the whole town was wiped out basically. And uh, so it was really interesting. And a lot of people, they grieved and they they went through a, a real hard time. And I, I remember when I was there one day at that particular store in Paradise, uh, talking with this guy and I thought, boy, he's familiar to me. He seems so familiar. And he was kind of quirky. He was wearing Birkenstocks and had on some shorts. And a, you know, he's talking about taking his motor home and driving to Vegas to show his art because he didn't too stressed to fly. He couldn't handle flying. And so he leaves and he, and he said he lived there in the area and, and he left and one of my employees goes, you know who that was? I go, he seemed very familiar. He goes, well, that was uh radar for mash. Oh, and my uh, God. yeah. So, so I mean, the Berghoff. Yeah. If you remember Gary, so I knew he, he was familiar to me, but sometimes when you see people out of a, an unfamiliar situation, they just, just doesn't seem right. You don't know who they are, even though you kind of recognize them, you know, but, uh, so I'm sure he lost his home too. Is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's a rough time. So yeah, I when you lost that house, I'm sure that was devastating in its own way. You right, know? right. It is. So in life, that's something that we have those up and downs. It's it's your book and and my book and and it's the story of life. And it's something that we don't want the bad things. It's not like we say, okay, let's have a pandemic, but you know, it's not something we will, but these things are just part of life. And one of the beautiful gifts I had as a young girl, um, when I was staying with grandparents about four or five years old, my grandmother would get with all these other women in grandmother age. So they were in their seventies to eighties and they came, this was LA, California. So they're from all over the world. And they just happened to live in the neighborhood and they were friends and they would have tea and I am like to be seen and not heard in the corner. And they would talk about their stories and it was living history for me. And it was what they, their adventures. And I thought as a little five-year-old kid, I thought, oh, I'm going to have some grand adventures too. And I'm going to be yeah. okay like they are. I'm going to be good. And so that they, those stories, stuck with me. And those ladies, I actually, until they all passed away, I I had them in my home. I had them for Thanksgiving and holiday meals. They were part of my family and they got to share their stories with my children. And it really gave us a lot of strength. So the stories aren't new. We just are living them for the first time. <laughs> yeah. And, and we learn from others. We know that I mean, when you were five years old hearing these stories, it gave you a desire to go out and do some of those things. And that's one of the things I ask people when they're on my podcast, talk about your life. And if, yeah. if there's certain things that impacted you in your youth that, uh, you know, kind of sent you down a certain trajectory, then certainly you need to talk about that. And, yeah. and they do. And, and, you know, for me, I mean, I don't know. I always like sports. I always like music. My, my dad was big into music. Uh, both my parents sang in the Mormon tabernacle choir, which, you know, a lot of people have heard of, and that was kind of a big deal. So, you know, I've been to over 200 concerts and I've seen Jimmy Buffett 13 times. Now, so when you say fun is good, right. can you imagine having more fun than being at a Jimmy Buffett concert? So, you know, but yeah, so yeah, we're impacted and we're, as we're little kids and we're watching what the adults are doing. And certainly that's where we get a lot of the things embedded in our minds that we want to do. And I, I can tell you that's got that, that, you know, initial desire to go to Hawaii is watching mm -hmm. The match game with Gene Rayburn and seeing him give away trips to Hawaii. And I tell my grandma, I'm going to go there someday and I'm going to live there. <laughs> yes. See how beautiful that is. So parents listening in, 
they're watching. And if you can bring some elders, it, maybe it's not something you can do right now, but have them on a Zoom call. Share the stories, elders. They're going to love to share the stories with yes. the other kids. And those those are the living history that's going to give us what we need to get through what we're going through right now and <laughs> to the other side. Yeah. Sure. yeah, we we can plant the seeds in these young minds in a good way to help them. Again, we talked earlier on our, uh, about being the importance of education and, and getting educated and, and learning. And it's not all in books. A lot of times it's taking advantage of hearing the stories like you did of the people who have lived, you know, before us and and have traveled the road, so to speak, so that maybe we can avoid some of those same mistakes, those same pitfalls. So, Yes, yeah. yes. It brings emotion. It brings a face mm -hmm. and somebody you care about that went through a living history. It brings that so that when I read those history books, I was like, oh, wow. Okay. It wasn't just numbers and something I had to memorize for the teacher. It had people and, and faces and emotion. And that I think is what's kind of missing all those important parts, everybody affected on every side of whatever happened <laughs> in all these different stories of our history. And so when you bring that in, then it's interesting. The kids want to learn. They want to hear because you care about the characters. Imagine you're reading a book and you don't care about the characters. That's that yeah. would be such a good book. Yeah. That's no fun. Yeah, but when you care about them, then you're like, well, this is important. I need to learn this because I don't want this to happen. And and I cared about, you know, it's a whole different, different way of teaching history for sure. <laughs> anyway, Larry, yeah. we are we are coming to the, the end of our talking time. So I'd love for you to share where people can get your book. Um, maybe hold your book up again um, so they can see the name of the book, how they can get a hold of it, and maybe where they can tune into your podcast as well. Nobody there it is. Knows. Nobody knows. I just want you to think they do. Yes. And you can pick the book up pretty much anywhere. It's on Amazon or, or wherever. But um, my website is just nobodyknowslarrycamp.com. It's mm -hmm. pretty simple. Yeah. So uh, in, in, I talk there about, um, I mean, it has my book, of course, and it, it shows my podcast episodes and different things like that. But, um, you know, the bottom line is I, I just am somebody that's a positive person. I just try to, sh you know, share that positive attitude that I have with other people. We're fortunate that when we relocated here three years ago, we were on I-15, which travels between Southern California and Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much where all of our friends and family are down south in the Phoenix area. But so we get a lot of visitors here. And when we bought our house, we bought one with a casita, if you know what that is, yes, um, yes. out in the back. And right. we have people there all the time. And it's so much fun for us to have people visit. So yeah. Um, because we I think maybe it's something about getting older, but we really enjoy having our friends and our family and new friends, you know, that you make too, uh -huh. and just, just sitting around and visiting and talking and, you know, it doesn't have to be always going somewhere, always doing something. Those times are fun too, but just sitting around and, and sharing life experiences and, you know, just talking like we've done today yeah. to me, that's uh that's one of my favorite things to do. So, Sheila, I really appreciate you having me on your, your podcast, your show today, and, uh, and for letting me just to talk about myself and, and to share and learn a little bit about you as well and your story. All right. All right. Thank you again, Larry. And for those tuning in, we'll be back after these messages. All right. All right. Thank you. If you are just tuning in, this is NBC Sheila Mack Show here on KCAA Radio, the station that leaves no listener behind. I'm your host, Sheila Mack. And I have some news for you. Yes, you. I'm celebrating my third year now on the station and will be expanding the show to a global network as well. You may now find the Sheila Mack Show on all major podcasting channels. And if you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel, all the episodes are now available for viewing there as well. And I'm asking you for a quick favor. If you like the show, please help support the spread of this reboot channel on YouTube as well. My goal is to help as many people as possible through our interesting times to rebuild, reinvent, and reboot your business and personal life. I also wanted to share a little bit more about how I got here. 
what I do now and how designing a business career and life on your terms is more than possible at any age or stage in life. I am an enterprisingly forward-thinking consultant, show host, and best-selling author. But how did I get here? Well, I began my career as an entrepreneur and property investment strategist back when I was 23 years young, when I boldly quit my government job with NASA JPL to open my first of five large gift stores while also starting to invest in property. I got to work with some of the world's most loved companies, such as negotiations on leases with Warner Brothers and winning trips to London as the top selling Crabtree and Evelyn provider in the US for multiple years. My stores were built on heart as I gave back to the community I came from. So now, some of you know this and some of you don't know this, but as a young girl with parents who were not well enough to care for me, I was homeless at age 10, then in foster care where it was really hard to get a job while in the system. I finally emancipated at the age of 15 to start college early. While running my stores, I worked with a government program. Back then, it was called Job Training Partnership Act, making my stores an open source training site where close to 200 at-risk youth started their careers. Yes, I began my career helping business leaders and working professionals to design a life they love where they can have success in their careers and get to the business of life. See, a funny thing happened along the way. Uh, when I first opened my gift store, it was kind of crazy because I was this young upstart. That's what a lot of the store owners called me. Uh, my first store was in Montrose, California, in this sweet little hometown uh, shopping park with other stores and restaurants nearby. And so I was the young upstart that didn't know what she was doing. At least that's what everybody said. And I didn't really care what they said. <laughs> uh, I, at that age, you know, their opinion was like, I don't really care. So that, that was probably a really good thing because I stayed focused on what I needed to do. And I had negotiated uh, to lease out a 5,000 square foot gift store that needed a lot of work and I, I got free rent and uh, for about six months and I had to start making the rent, which was 5,000 a month, which was a lot of money back then, a dollar a square foot. And so I had to learn and relearn. I, I finally did hire quite, quite soon in the game. I did hire a marketing expert, branding expert, I guess back then. And uh, that lady really helped me to figure things out when I first started. And when you first start a business, especially when you're young, it was like <laughs> I had no idea what to do. But I needed to learn because my rent was going to start coming due every month. And over that time, I started having more success. I did crazy things like stayed open until almost midnight every night, along with the restaurants who were very close to my store, while everybody else closed shop at about 5 or 6 p.m. So I was making more money from the start, and I just really my store was to help my kids and the products I sold was whatever the community wanted. I sold lots of things to people in the entertainment industry. I worked with cruise ships. I worked with many different people in the community. And later on, the store owners actually came to me and asked me if I would consult them and help them. I actually started buying my other buildings because I didn't like the idea of paying rent for years and years and years and not building equity. So I did get my real estate license uh, through that and invested and bought my other four store buildings. And uh, lots of the other store owners worked with me, paid me <laughs> to consult and help them do what I was doing. And I didn't really even know it was called consulting. I just knew how to figure it out, I guess. And so that's how I started my career. And now 
you know, I raised six children, all that, and now they're grown. And so I get to come to work every day and do what I naturally do best as an entre enterprising and forward thinking business leader. Through my show courses and live events, I guide entrepreneurs and working professionals like you through the profitable steps of building a business, creation to expansion, marketing from planning to implementation, wealth preservation through strategic planning and yes, real estate investing, and lifestyle design so that you can earn more while getting back to the business of living your best life. So I do invite you to tune in here uh, to KCAA radio. And also I would really appreciate it if you went to my YouTube channel, Sheila Mack show and gave a subscribe and a listen to some of your favorite shows. And I do have some other exciting things, including a free gift to thank you. So if you go to www.sheilamack.com, that's S-H-E-I-L-A-M-A-C, sheilamack.com, there you can get a free gift to get started on your reboot this year. And now back to the show. Hey, thank you guys. Bye-bye. All right. If you're just tuning in, this is NBC Sheila Mack show here on KCAA radio, the station that leaves no listener behind. And we are also streaming to YouTube at Sheila Mack show and all major podcasting channels. And we'll be visiting some other special shows. I have switched to all natural beauty. So if you'd like to learn more, go to SheilaMack.com and click on Natural Beauty to learn about Beauty Counter. And uh, that is something I'm now repping, but I also am only using the Beauty Counter All Natural Products. Uh, it has made a huge difference in my complexion and is a wonderful way to just only have natural products on your body can also go to beautycounter.com slash Sheila, S-H-E-I-L-A, Mac, M-A-C. But the easiest thing to do is just go to SheilaMac.com, S-H-E-I-L-A-M-A-C.com, and then look for the Natural Beauty tab. You are tuning in to The Sheila Mac Show, where we answer real questions with real solutions to help you reboot your business and personal life. Now, I have reminded you about my new best-selling book, Bootstraps and Bra Straps, the formula to go from rock bottom back into action in any situation, and the core of that book is lifestyle design. So it's going through chapters of different things that happen in everybody's life to one extent or another. We talk about starting over, rebooting, get on back on track after losing a loved one, a divorce, our kids grow up, we are parenting our parents and more, relationships, ups and downs, renegotiating relationships, business, career. And it all, every time you have a life shift, you have the opportunity to redesign your life. And so the main focus is every chapter will help you reboot through where you are you go to the chapter that speaks to you during this time in your life, and then you go to the main focus of the book, which is lifestyle design and getting back on track. But this time, the difference is you get to live life on your terms. All right, so to learn more, go to SheilaMack.com. My name is spelt S-H-E-I-L-A. MAC.com. And there I also have a free gift for you. Looking forward to seeing you there. And as always, I wish you life, love, laughter, and light.